right, well, good morning. Hello, welcome to this panel on deterring and promoting accountability for corrupt actors through sanctions and visa restrictions. My name is Richard Nephew, and I am the uh, first coordinator for global anti-corruption at the U.S. State Department. And I want to thank today's panelists for participating and also thank Transparency International co-hosts. Today, we're gathered to discuss just one piece of the anti-corruption policy puzzle, that of accountability. I've been working in the national security space for a very long time, and much of that has involved sanctions work. Often while traveling to discuss the need for countries to impose or enforce sanctions, I found that I was not always the most popular person uh, to show up, although that's been attributed to my own personality uh, by more than a few of my colleagues. That's simply not been the case, though, as I've traveled in this job and discussed accountability. On this issue, I found support for the use of accountability tools, including sanctions, nearly everywhere I've gone. And I think the reason for this is the common sense that we all probably have when contemplating accountability, that someone who has committed a crime, and one that so abuses the trust and confidence of a population as corruption, should face the consequences for their actions. That to do so serves both justice and deterrence of other ne'er-do-wells. That to do so gives something back to a population that has been victimized by corruption. Ideally, of course, accountability is delivered by local law enforcement and justice sectors. That is, after all, their jobs. And certainly it's a focus of a lot of the anti-corruption capacity building and work that we at the State Department and other parts of the U.S. government uh, do. But in many places around the world, that is often not possible. And with corruption itself often playing a role in the denial of justice and accountability. And that is where our discussion today comes in how accountability can be provided by external actors, how the tools themselves work, and the theory of the case as to their efficacy and use. For today's event, we'll explore with our panelists the policy goals behind anti-corruption sanctions and visa restriction tools, the mechanics of how they work. And we can also discuss some of the challenges to their use, and importantly, how governments can work together with civil society to use these tools to encourage change. I'd also like to note for our audience that our panelists today will not be able to discuss specific individual designations. U.S. law precludes us from discussing visa records, and we'd rather keep the focus on the utility of and challenges to the tools writ large, which I think is also much more in keeping with the overall uh, effort of the IACC. I must also note that, of course, we have colleagues you know, gathered you know, here around this table from uh, both the U.S. government, from civil society, and from the British government. But of course, there are many other colleagues who uh, work in our various different governments and organizations also on these issues. And in this uh, case, I'd like to uh, pay particular note uh, to the creation of the sanctions coordinator position at the State Department and the work of Jim O'Brien, uh, who is our sanctions coordinator and is very focused on this issue and sends his regards. All right, now let's turn to the panel. First, I would like to welcome Jonathan Dixon from the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control. The Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, administers and enforces economic and trade sanctions based on U.S. foreign policy and national security goals against targeted foreign countries and regimes, terrorists, international narcotics traffickers, those engaged in activities related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and other threats to the national security, foreign policy, or the economy of the United States. Jonathan is chief of OFAC's branch that manages the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program, our government's foremost global anti-corruption sanctions tool. We're also joined by Christine Klein from the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. Christine is a division chief in INL's Office of Global Policy and Programs, and her office oversees implementation of U.S. visa restrictions against officials who participate in significant corruption. Her office also works closely with Jonathan and Treasury on sanctions actions. I'm also very pleased that we could be joined by Jonathan Bahala, a senior governance advisor from the UK's Illicit Finance and Anti-Corruption Department, part of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We're very grateful that you're able to travel so far to take part in this event, and thank you for joining us. Finally, we're grateful to have Kush Yamin from Transparency International completing our panel. Kush is the legal director of the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium, or GAC. The consortium is a partnership between Transparency International and the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project that brings together investigative journalism and civil society advocacy to fight international corruption. This is an excellent panel that's heavy with expert practitioners in their fields. So let's get started right away with some questions. We're going to turn first to Jonathan Dixon. We have to be careful. We have, we have two Jonathans. Jonathan Dixon 
Let's start with a question about anti-corruption sanctions. Many in this room are familiar with Global Magnitsky, but could you describe how we as a government identify appropriate targets? And could you elaborate on what your theory of change is behind the use of sanctions? What is the U.S. government hoping to achieve by the use of sanctions against corrupt actors? Thanks for that question, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, so we were just talking about how OFAC can be a little bit of a black box sometimes, or at least has that appearance. So happy to talk about the method to our madness. Um, when we talk about sanctions, particularly when it relates to anti-corruption, we're really going for two different um, end goals. And the first is to address the behavior of the individual that is actually designated. Uh, we're trying to restrict their access to the international financial system, particularly given the prominence of the U.S. dollar in banking. Uh, and this is to stop them from moving their illicit gains. It also protects the U.S. financial system from corruption. Moreover, the sanctions, when we publish a, a press release, highlights the activity that they're designated for. And this is both to encourage behavior change from that individual, maybe uh, broadly discuss typologies that other governments can be on the lookout for, and hopefully try to uh, encourage other potentially corrupt actors to rethink their actions, be aware that the U.S. government is looking at corruption in all areas and really takes a strong interest in this problem set. But I think equally important is the second end goal that we're looking for when we talk about sanctions, which is addressing jurisdictions that allow corruption to foster. Um, to this end, we really try to focus our efforts on countries where not only is corruption an endemic issue, but that there seems to be appetite for systemic change. Uh, our approach then is to highlight multiple corrupt actors in a jurisdiction and encourage these governments to pursue accountability through whatever means they have at their availability. Um, Part of this is to create a political environment less permissive of corruption. Part of this is to take whatever uh, local domestic authorities they might have to uh, pursue these officials, maybe through law enforcement actions. Um, we also work with our counterparts to really do follow-on actions because, as we all know, sanctions are sort of the beginning of this anti-corruption process. So to that end, we're looking at helping with anti-corruption legislation, um, training civil society watchdogs, and even identifying places where we think the local authorities can, can intersect to take action. Great, thank you very much. All right, next we're gonna turn over to num Jonathan number two, Jonathan Bahala. Uh, let me address my next question uh, to you. Uh, your government's global anti-corruption sanctions regime is relatively new, having just been operationalized uh, last year. With the experience of establishing a new legal authority fresh in your mind, uh, what were the major challenges in setting up GACs, and how did the UK overcome them? Um, has civil society played a role in shaping and now implementing the program, and if so, how? Brilliant. Well, look, thank you, and th thank, you for, thank you for inviting me here. It's, um, it's, it's really great to sort of be here and discuss this with you, and, and, and particularly with, with US colleagues, who, who I think we recognize as definitely sort of leaders in this space, and, and, and we really appreciate that, and have, and, and have really benefited from, from, from engaging with you uh, in many ways on this agenda. So uh, I just want to tell you a bit about sort of uh, the journey that we went on, really, to, to create GACs and, and, and some of the challenges that we overcome, overcame. I mean, I think, I think one of the first things that we, we really sort of were confronted with was, um, you know, once we had sort of political license to take forward this, the design of this regime, we were really bringing together two kind of different parts of, of the system that really didn't previously talk to each other. So we had a sanctions capability that was, that was really quite mature in, in, in FCBO, but, but, but predominantly uh, had geographic remits um, uh, or geogra geographic sanctions regimes. Uh, and they didn't really, or had never to, uh, until then, thought about you know, corruption as an issue in and of itself. Uh, and similarly, with our, certainly with our central uh, corruption sort of uh, team and, and, and network of people across the globe, um, you know, we, we, we didn't really think about sanctions as a, as, a, as, as a tool that we could use to counter corruption. I mean, partly that was because, you, you know, the, the majority of the FCDO's corruption uh, expertise came from the Department for International Development, and we were very much focused on using sort of development leaders to tackle this problem. So, 
So it was really, really a, a sort of, um, you know, coming together of, of, of two agendas uh, in, in a quite an interesting way. And I think, I think um, you, you know, in the design of the regime, uh, and as a result of that context, there was, I suppose, probably four sort of challenges that we, that we sort of had to overcome, uh, you know, in the design process. So the first was around, you know, how do you define corruption? Um, uh, and in the regulations. And, and there are obviously sort of, you know, ev everyone here will know there are very long-standing debates and, uh, about sort of what is and what isn't corruption, which we wanted to sort of avoid the regime becoming embroiled in. And so we uh, f therefore decided to focus on, you know, bribery and misappropriation specifically, which is a narrower focus to, to what other, other, other corruption sanctions regimes have, have taken, um, but, but we felt was appropriate for our purposes Partly because this is, is, partly because this is, you know, these are the two forms of corruption that UNCAC mandates uh, rather than recommends, um, and uh, you know, in the assessment of, of, of potential cases that we did, you know, we found that actually most, the vast majority of cases involved a, a, a form of bribery or misappropriation. So it was it was pretty sort of broad in its 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 its, its sort of scope anyway. I mean, we thought about uh, abuse of functions as a as a, as a criteria and sort of. Um, moved off it um, <coughs> partly because we felt that you know it, it, it could constitute a range of activity that that could be seen as sort of poor governance and not really defined not really kind of considered uh, objectively a serious corruption and we wanted to sort of avoid sort of some of the complications that may ar ar arise from that the second issue was around the balance between public and private sector corruption uh, and ultimately we we decided to focus on on, on public sector corruption as a, as a, as a focus um, principally because this was a foreign policy tool and, and, and so that, that felt more relevant in that sense, but also because you know, one of our overarching objectives is really you know, how, do we, how do we target those people who are undermining the ability of governments to deliver for their people? Uh, and it felt that, that, that public sector corruption was, was the best way into, that, uh, in, into, into achieving that objective. So private sector actors can be designated under our regime, but they need to involve corruption involving, a, or bribery and misappropriation involving a, a public sector, a public official. Um, thirdly, is around, it, it was around sort of who to target. Um, and again, we, we took a decision to, to focus on foreign public officials as opposed to public officials more generally. Uh, and that was because, you know, we, what, what we wanted to do was avoid, um, uh, you know, corruption that was, that was, that was uh, only uh, that was specifically UK-based because we have systems and laws in place to, to, to deal with to deal with UK-based corruption. But we wanted to include corruption that, that is transnational and has a UK nexus. Um, and so the foreign public officials allowed us to strike that balance. So you could be uh, a lawyer in, in, in X jurisdiction or a, or a banker in the UK, uh, and you could be designated as long as, you know, uh, as, long as that involved um, uh, corruption with a foreign public official, not, not, not a UK public official. Um, and then, and then we also wanted to reflect um, the fact that you know corruption isn't just a few bad apples, but it but it's a system. Um, and so we took a pretty broad, um, a pretty broad sort of um, approach to involvement. So so you can be designated for facilitating, um, uh, preventing uh, the investigation of laundering the proceeds of um, of corruption. So so a whole range of of activities which which allows us to, to target sort of family members and facilitators. As well as, or instead of, the actual, the actual sort of public official involved in corruption, and then, and then, lastly, I'll just say that we, you know, one of the things that we were really conscious of was to design a regime that, that complemented or added value to our law enforcement capability, or capabilities, and, uh, and in particular, what we wanted to do was to avoid a situation where uh, law enforcement under relevant legislation wanted to recover assets but couldn't do so because they were sanctioned, because when you sanction assets. Uh, they, they are done so in perpetuity, so, so no one can deal with them. Um, and this actually turned out to be quite, quite kind of very legally complex in the UK, and I, I won't sort of pretend to sort of um, to fully understand it or to, or to know about it, but I mean, essentially, we were able to sort of design a workaround where the Office for, San for Sanctions Implementation, so the equivalent of OFAC in the, in the US, uh, was able to, to issue a general license that uh, permitted law enforcement to comply with relevant legislation uh, and comply with court orders, forfeiture notices, whatever they may be, to deal with um, uh, assets of sanctioned individuals uh, you know, as per necessary. 
um, to, to their activity. So, so that was, um, you know, uh, something that we that we couldn't do right at the beginning of the regime, but but something that we were able to sort of uh, implement thereafter. Anyway, so th those were some of, some of the sort of main issues that we grappled with, and hopefully that gives you a broad sort of sense of our regime. Just a quick word on civil society engagement. I mean, you know, we've had a pretty pretty sort of I would like to think uh, a pretty sort of uh, robust and, and regular engagement with civil society on, on the design of the regime. I don't think we necessarily saw eye to eye on every issue, and, and so there are probably some, 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 some aspects of our regime that civil society would have preferred w were different. Um, but, 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 you know, but, but, but I think they, they appreciated, and we certainly appreciated the engagement around that. Um, I mean, obviously, there is, there is a sort of a challenge that we have around, I mean, that everyone has, I think, around how, how we can engage with civil society with respect to specific cases, um, uh, you know, which we, which, we, which we can't do for, very, for, for, for legal reasons, uh, uh, which I think everyone appreciates. Um, but I think it can frustrate the relationship at, at times, and, and, and so that's why it's great to be here today, to be able to talk in these sorts of environments, um, to, 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 to be really clear that, you know, we really value the, 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 the work that civil society do, and we take it all on board, even if we can't always sort of um, talk about it or respond to it in a way that, um, that, that, that may be helpful to, to, to them. Um, yeah, I'll stop there, because I think I've talked too long. But no, great, thank you very much. I have to say, you know, again, from working on a variety of sanctions regimes over the years, the idea of being able to start with a blank sheet of paper and to think about what makes a lot of sense uh, is a very attractive proposition. So it's useful to, to see how you were thinking about it and the kinds of questions you were asking, uh, asking yourselves. Um, next, let's turn over to uh, uh, Christine Klein uh, and change the subject a little bit to talk about uh, visa restrictions. Compared to sanctions programs, visa restrictions are probably less familiar to many in our audience. And can you describe uh, what these restrictions entail um, and how the department applies them and under what criteria? Broadly speaking, how has use of visa restrictions impacted diplomatic relations in countries where they've been deployed against corrupt officials? And what have been some of the impediments of using visa restrictions more broadly? And I think you've got a presentation, or at least a couple of slides. At least a couple of slides. All right, great. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for the opportunity um, to provide an overview of this <coughs> complementary tool to what has been described by um, the two Jonathans here on the panel this morning. Uh, so the State Department's Bureau for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs implements the corruption prong of what is called Section 7031C of the State Department's Annual Appropriations Act. And this provision requires the Secretary of State to designate current or former foreign government officials if the Secretary has credible information they've been involved in significant corruption. And I should say our designations can be both public or private. And once designated, these individuals are generally ineligible from entering the United States. But there's no financial sanctions associated with this uh, ineligibility. So why don't we dig a dip, bit deeper? So the purpose of this authority, we identify significant corruption as some form of bribery, misappropriation of public funds, or corrupt interference in judicial electoral electoral or other public processes. And we really take our responsibility seriously. We've increased our staff resources to implement the law. And if we look at the next slide, uh, we can see how that's correlated to the number of public designations by the secretary. I think it jumped from about five in 2017 to 77 last year. And we don't have the final uh, numbers in yet for 2022, but I, I think we're on target to surpass our record from last year. And it's important to note that these numbers include both corrupt officials, but also their immediate family members. Um, Section 7031C automatically applies to the spouses and children of corrupt actors. And I think this adds a particular, both a deterrent element, but also a particularly significant impact. So no more trips to Disney World, no uh, studying in US universities, and no shopping trips um, once, once folks are designated. And while the number of designations has certainly increased, we still devote significant time and effort to each case. I should really stress the evidentiary requirements are quite high for this authority. We generally require corroborated information on particular corrupt acts. And if we have the information, we have to act. The authority is um, mandatory. So Richard, you asked about the impact on uh, diplomatic relations. And I'm really pleased to say that I think these designations have been um, appreciated by civil society, uh, by segments of the general public, um, 
and, and even governments that support transparency and anti-corruption action. I mean, we typically get a, a good reception on social media, for example, once we make our designations public. And we've really faced, I think, minimal diplomatic obstacles, I think in part because they're targeting people uh, and not entire governments or ministries. And we've seen these inspire positive reforms, which of course is one of the goals of the tools. We've seen designees resign from office. We've seen them stop political campaigns. We've seen um, the removal of individuals from public positions. And we've also, in a few instances, seen uh, criminal investigations. So moving to what some of the impediments have been, I, I'm sure this is likely some of the same challenges faced by um, our colleagues from Treasury, but it, it's around and information. It is quite difficult uh, to obtain sufficiently specific and credible information on corrupt acts. I mean, we need fire, uh, not just to smoke, so to speak. And these cases really do undergo significant legal scrutiny, so it's not always possible to have the level of detail required. I mean, we can't take simple speculation or circumstantial evidence. Again, we need corroborated sources of information. And I, I think this is why we are so pleased, in part, to support civil society efforts to uncover corruption, whether it's through the Summit for Democracy process or initiatives like the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium. Um, for example, in the Summit for Democracy process, the United States uh, launched what's called the Democracies Against Safe Haven Initiative, and in part, um, that is aimed at providing assistance to uh, civil society to help them uncover and share uh, information about uh, corrupt acts. And I would also be remiss if I, I didn't recognize the role of civil society in simply the establishment of these authorities. You know, advocacy is very important. And I think we're eager to see our partner countries establish similar tools um, so we can grow the impact and really close off safe havens. We've had a great partnership working with the UK and, and we hope to expand it to others. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Christine. And and I'll just uh, underline uh, one of your your uh, you know comments. A pretty ominous ending about how the numbers for 2022 aren't done yet. Um, but but I'll I'll actually I'll. I'll use that to also underscore the fact that this is work that's constantly ongoing. Um, you know, uh, for a while, I think, you know, there were uh, a, a number of indications or a number of, of allegations that we were, you know, processing these on the basis of some, you know, organized, you know, time frame or so forth. Frankly, this work is just ongoing constantly, and the investigation is ongoing constantly. The evidence gathering is ongoing constantly. And so, you know, when we have an information to be able to make these determinations, that's when the, the deter decisions and determinations are made. And as Christine was saying, that ultimately comes back uh, to issues of evidence. Um, which is a, a nice way of segueing uh, uh, to our, our, our civil society uh, partner, uh, you know, at the table of Kush. So, you know, let me ask uh, for a different take on these tools, um, the view from civil society. Can you describe your organization's work in building roads between civil society and governments on the use of deterrence tools? What are some of the biggest impediments you found regarding information sharing? Are there certain risks that come with sharing this information to civil society and to your organization uh, particularly? And what more could governments do to encourage engagement with civil society and improve information sharing? Thank you. Um, so firstly, thank you for the opportunity to speak today for the organizers of the panel. Um, it's been really gratifying to see in recent years how willing governments have been to actually work with and speak to civil society organizations um, to actually ensure that these mechanisms are used effectively. Um, I want to highlight a few organizations that have actually done, played key roles in each of their jurisdictions. So you've got Human Rights First in the United States, Redress in the United Kingdom, ASEPI uh, in the European Union, and the Raoul Wallenberg Center in Canada. And without them and their work in making sure that each of us as civil society organizations have access to the mechanisms, none of the works takes place. Um, so in terms of civil transparency international specifically and the work that we do on the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium that was mentioned earlier, um, we're a partnership together with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project where we try and take the actionable evidence that they derive from their investigations into grand corruption and to turn them into uh, legal submissions in various jurisdictions around the world. And obviously, being able to do, make sanctioned submissions is a key uh, opportunity for us. Um, our end goal is to get the information into the hands of decision makers who can actually do something about it eventually. And that's why having this interaction is so, so valuable to us to be able to explain our cases, explain why it's so important for civil society in each of these jurisdictions to see some measure of accountability taking place. Um, because they, especially in some jurisdictions where 
they don't always see that. Accountability isn't possible in all places around the world. So where it is possible and where the UK or the U US government can help in that regard can be incredibly valuable. Um, I just wanted to re relay one anecdote of a situation that happened recently. I was having a conversation with a uh, lawyer who works in the refugee space and a high level public official in their country had actually recently been designated and completely unprompted when they spoke to me about my work their face lit up when they started to talk about the fact that this individual who had previously seemed untouchable had had something happen to them which caused them great difficulty. And it really highlighted that it's not just for those of us that are working in the corruption space, it's the citizens, it's the civil society organizations that are operating in, in these countries, in these really tough jurisdictions. When they see some measure of accountability, it can have a snowball effect because it encourages them to work on these particular types of cases and bring to light these kind of activities that previously would have been held un unaccountable. Um, I think there are certain impediments and the black box has already been referred to and something that I'm sure each of you have been told by civil society organizations about in the past. Um, and undoubtedly, that can lead to a reluctance from some civil society organization. We have limited time and resources um, in our work and being able to see the impact um, from the work that we do is really important for, for fundraising, for motivation. Um, but I, I do really want to stress that we fully understand that there are limitations on what you're able to do and there are legal risks involved that we are very cognizant of. Um, but I, one thing I will stress is that where it is at all possible after a designation is made to provide information, that can have a really, really important impact. I personally worked on a, a couple of cases where we've been able to use information that's been provided in a sanctions designation. And that can, that's led to follow-up inquiries that we've been able to make. We've had to be able to speak to our investigative journalist partners. We've been able to work with our civil society partners. And they've taken the names of those companies, those projects, and that leads to further opportunities. So the more information that can be provided, the more we can do with it. And I think that's a really important message to be conveyed um, because sometimes that can get a little bit lost, unfortunately. Um, as was always also been mentioned, information sharing is incredibly important. And the safety and security of our civil society partners is paramount um, to ensure that there is no risk of reprisal against them willing to stand up against this kind of uh, activity. Um, it's not just to them, it's to their families, it's to their friends. Um, so we even have situations where we'll undertake a risk assessment, we'll undertake mitigation strategies, but if the risk is deemed too high, we won't submit that information because the safety is paramount. And that's why having safe and secure channels in where we can provide this information is so, so important. And not just the US and UK governments, but for any of the other government entities that are involved in these kind of regimes, it's one thing I'd like to stress, and please find me afterwards and we can figure out a way of doing this. Um, we'd love to be able to find a way of hand being able to file this information, real, actionable intelligence that is coming from journalists, from civil society organizations, and get it in your hands. And then it's really up to you guys to do what you do. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it there, but those are the two main things we'd ask for. That was great, thank you. And, and you know, I think actually in those, those two comments, you, you, you spotlight the tensions that we have, you know, where, you know, in, in part some of the reasons for the difficulty in passing back information about, you know, how uh, evidence was used in, you know, cases and to be able to provide information is in part also a protection function, you know, if some of the folks are involved. I, I think it's a tricky space. I will say I've heard a, a very similar line of, of commentary from civil society colleagues when I've, I've met with them around the world. And it's something I think we're thinking about and trying to see whether or not there are ways we can improve that back and forth communication, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And uh, hopefully, uh, during the, the question time, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to, to have some questions uh, that we'll, we'll push into that space, too. Um, one last question for all of you, and so we'll just come back this way, um, and uh, feel free to just pass the mic as you, as you go. Um, you know, obviously, the name of the panel, well, it used to be up there, the name of the panel is about sanctions and accountability tools. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, that the, therefore has been our focus here. Um, but could each of you talk a little bit about how you see these tools in the broader uh, anti-corruption uh, fight? You know, obviously we're not going to sanction uh, corruption out of existence, so what are the other efforts that are necessary, you know, here? And, and Jonathan Bahala, actually, uh, you know, you were talking a little bit about the need to bring together development folks and, you know, folks who are working on illicit finance space. You must have had some of those debates and discussions very recently. So in, in particular, any, any reflections you would have of that uh, would, be, uh, would be quite interesting. But let's, let's start with question, and then we'll, we'll walk away uh, this way. 
Sure, I'm glad I get to start actually because then I get to hear what you guys say. Um, two things I'd really like to stress. Um, firstly, multilateralism I think is really important. It's great to see the UK and the US government representatives here today and obviously uh, Canada and Australia have also added uh, got corruption to their regimes. Um, one big lacuna is the European Union, and it was great to see recently that uh, the Commission President uh, van der Leyen mentioned that they are intending on adding corruption to their regime um, hopefully very soon. We'll monitor that and hopefully it will get implemented correctly. But I think it goes without saying that the ability to cut these kinds of actors out of the sterling dollar and euro markets can have a huge impact in making sure that their access to the global financial markets are limited. It can have a debilitating impact on them if they aren't able to transact with businesses that are operating in these jurisdictions. Um, so the more that there can be simultaneous designations made between the various governments, uh, the more uh, powerful the mechanism, the more um, buy-in you will get from these kind of sanctions and uh, visa restriction regimes. Um, we've had situations in the past where individuals have been designated in one regime and then simply move their business to a different currency. And I think going forward, as that's a really important issue to, to try and counteract. Um, I know that the, uh, it, it can be very tricky because of the different thresholds and the evidentiary requirements, but um, it's something that where possible, we would always try and push for. Um, secondly, I think sanctions always have to be considered as part of a wider suite of uh, tools that are available <coughs> to governments and the, the, their ability to tackle grand corruption. Um, in many of the same activities that are mentioned in any of the cases that are submitted, there might be the pis uh, possibility of looking at the extraterritorial application of foreign bribery, um, aggressive enforcement of um, anti-money laundering violations, um, illicit enrichment where there's unexplained wealth in each of these jurisdictions, or regulatory powers by regulatory agencies. And I know that's obviously not the responsibility of many of you on this panel, but one thing that is within your controls is government coordination. Um, there, a more holistic whole of government approach to tackling grand corruption, where sanctions plays a very key role, but within sort of the widest suite of possibilities, um, can have a huge impact. Um, as much as we welcome sanctions designations, I think as civil society, we want to see the strongest possible ramifications for these individuals, for the activities that they entered into. Um, so we would really push for you to be able to interact with law enforcement where possible. And it's great to hear that Jonathan mentioned that that's something that was a, a key part of your consideration when you were putting in place the UK regime. Um, but I think the only way to truly disincentivize this behavior and prevent it from happening in the per first place is making sure that there are real and serious criminal consequences for this kind of behavior. Um, and it's not simply uh, the actors that are in many of the countries where this behavior takes place, but it's the Western actors in where in the supply um, of corruption that need to be considered. And again, it's great to hear Jonathan say that that's something that's actively being considered uh, in the UK space. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at those two, because I'm keen to hear from all of you whether you think any of these will be actually be possible. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Richard. Uh, I mean, I, I wanted to pick up on something Kush said about the, the holistic approach, because I think that's very much where, where we um, see this as part of the need to balance prevention and enforcement. I mean, I certainly don't think that we can sanction our way out of, of uh, corruption, um, but the accountability tools do have an important role. I think within the INL Bureau in particular, you know, we come at it from a, a three-prong approach. So first is our capacity building through foreign assistance. Um, then we have the, the development of our, our global standards and, and tools, um, and particularly through multilateral processes. And then, you know, thirdly are the accountability tools that we've discussed um, today. Um, and, you know, the capacity building, INL really has a good foundation to build on. You know, we have a, an almost global presence, partnerships with more than 90 countries in which we're providing a range of criminal justice assistance, but also um, targeted uh, work on anti-corruption, you know, whether it's practical skills training or helping um, develop legal institutions, reforms. 
But underpinning all of that work really is the global international architecture um, with the UN Convention Against Corruption you know, at the forefront. Um, INL in the United States has really tried to be a leader in that space. Um, you know, our bureau um, led the US delegation in those negotiations and we've really been active ever since in promoting that as the gold standard. Um, in addition to engaging through the numerous regional multilateral bodies that are all generating important standards and norms that complement uh, the UNCAC. I think as many of you know, um, the United States is poised to host uh, the UNCAC Conference of the States Parties in 2023. And I think that the States Parties in 2023, and I think that'll be an important opportunity, not just to advance implementation of the convention, but also to use it as an opportunity, you know, in our role as host to really highlight um, the, the role that civil society plays in our overall anti-corruption efforts. So I, I think, you know, many of us have worked on um, creating this anti-corruption architecture over the past more than two decades. And the task ahead of us is no less daunting, but I think that we are looking forward to um, working jointly both with our, our government partners and civil society on what the next phase uh, might look like. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, a few points from me. I mean, I may echo some of the some of the points already made, but 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 possibly say them slightly differently. I mean, the first one of the first things I would say, I, I, I do think these this is a pretty young tool uh, from an anti-corruption perspective, and so we need to we need to give it time. I mean, in the UK, you know, um, our regime was was developed during a global pandemic. Uh, since then, we've had Afghanistan. Now we have Ukraine. So it, it, it's not been the, the the sort of best time to make sort of maximum use of a, of a new tool like this um, to achieve its objectives. And I, th I think that point sort of speaks more broadly uh, to, to, to these regimes more generally. Um, secondly, I'd, I'd really sort of echo that point around, around uh, you know, if we're serious about, you know, using these tools to their effect, we, we cannot use them in isolation. And I, you know, that's not just a point about sanctions. I think that's a that's, that, that's, that, that applies equally to, to programming, to diplomacy, to whatever. I mean, as, as someone from a, from a development background, you know, I think, I think donors have learned very hard lessons over the years about the, limitation, what, you know, the limitations and the possibilities for what aid can do in tackling grand, grand corruption in, in particular countries. Um, and so really it is about how we bring, bring these things together to, to achieve objectives. And I think that brings me on to my, my next point, which is, I mean, I think we need to think less about sanctions as a solution uh, and much more about uh, what is our strategy for combating corruption in a particular country? What is the problem that we want to solve? Does it have local legitimacy? Does it have buy-in? Uh, who, who can help us push that domestically? And then think about what, what role sanctions can play alongside you know, other levers and tools that we have to, to affect change. And that, um, you know, that's that that's that's ultimately the, the the real challenge. And I think that is the sort of high end of the ambition for for, for, for sanctions. I don't think that's, you know, you can still have you do useful things with sa corruption sanctions that that don't necessarily meet that high level of ambition. But I do think that it, it is worth sort of holding ourselves up to that standard because that's ultimately what we're fighting for. And. You know, I, I do. I do think it, it's possible. I think there's reason to believe it's 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 possible. You know, if you if you take the sort of parallel of Ukraine and uh, and what's happened since the since the the, the conflict is out has, has broken out, and you and you think and you look at sort of the way in which sanctions have been used alongside uh, a whole range of other around other you know capabilities, you know, including you know, military support, strategic communications, diplomatic pressure. You know, w working in a sort of multilateral way to, to sort of isolate, you know, Russia and, and, and restrict its long-term ability to, to, to be, um, you know, to continue its aggression. It, it, it certainly leads me to think, well, that's not not a bad parallel to sort of draw here, or some some inspiration to draw in terms of what you could you can potentially achieve strategic objectives um, uh, for. Um, so so that you know th 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 that's that, and then. I suppose the, the last point I would make is we should remember, I think, that it, sanctions may not always be the right 
answer. Um, I think you know one of the broader lessons from from, san from the use of sanctions more broadly is that they can have you know undesired uh, effects. Um, and I think you know one of the lessons certainly from anti-corruption evidence suggests that you know uh, often good intentions by external actors can can have the opposite of effect in terms of in terms of its ability to affect corruption. Um, so so we should sort of um, you, you know be very live to the fact that sanctions may not be appropriate despite despite how bad corruption may be in a particular context, it just may not be the right tool to use uh, and could, could potentially have, have sort of negative unintended consequences. And, and, and that I do think we need to keep at the, at the forefront of our mind as we look to use these tools more, use them more collectively, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that's probably just a sort of counter to that. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. All right. That's a bit of a tricky question for us because as the <laughs> office that does sanctions and only sanctions, um, when you are the hammer, everything looks like a nail. So a lot of what we do after the initial designation is really expanding that effort. Um, we are in, we routinely reach out to foreign governments and and private sector and let them know, hey, if you engage with these corrupt actors, if you facilitate this corruption you know, you are also potentially a target for future designations. Our executive order has a prong that relates to material support or facilitation um, that we can use as a follow-on action. We also uh, work with our foreign counterparts, you know, hopefully trying to get other countries to join and develop their own global Magnitsky-like programs. So as you mentioned, a multilateral approach to sanctions is always preferable, not only because you're keeping these actors from accessing different currencies, but also because a message where multiple partners join in uh, highlighting a corruption scheme, just it, it's, it foot stomps the action across the international community. It's not just the US calling out bad behavior, it's multiple people. Um, but you know, that being said, acknowledging that sanctions are the stick, you do have to provide some sort of carrot. Uh, if that's in the form of development assistance, working with these local jurisdictions to somehow um, either bump up their own domestic auditing regimes, uh, provide some sort of mechanism where they can report corruption to their domestic authorities, we see that as another useful tool to help uh, address corruption at the root level because I think as everybody acknowledges this isn't an act uh, this isn't something that's going to go away uh, this isn't something that one country can impose on another country to fix it all requires uh, working at a grassroots level in country and that's also where we look at our civil society partners to continue doing the amazing work that you all do which is which is routinely finding these these corruption schemes <coughs> publishing it uh, documenting it, and as you know, many have said, often at great risk to yourself or to your your sources. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, as as every time I would teach my my students at Columbia about sanctions policy, I would always say, remember this is a foreign policy class, and that you got to use all the aspects of foreign policy. If you're trying to do uh, this with just one tool, you're going to fail, whether or not that's sanctions or something else. So I think we, we got a number of, of good points, observations, and ideas about the way in which to build a much more comprehensive uh, comprehensive approach, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've got a number of sanctions and restrictions and accountability tool practitioners uh, you know, here in the room. I think there's a broad recognition of that. Um, okay, uh, so now we're going to turn over to our question and answer uh, 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 period. Um, we've got a few minutes, and I've, we've got a large number of people here in the room. We're going to do this the old-fashioned way, so hands up, and we've got a microphone that'll be floating around. I saw this gentleman uh, first. Um, let me just note, um, uh, for folks who are visiting online, unfortunately, we cannot actually see your questions if you have them, so please uh, do uh, uh, provide them, and we'll see if we can provide responses subsequently. And also, one last observation, uh, questions usually are only about a sentence, maybe too long, and they end with a question mark. Uh, so I would very much appreciate the questions in the room uh, taking that same form. Good morning. My name is David Phillips. I head the program on peace building and human rights at Columbia University. Uh, my question has to do with transparency. I know an individual who's been designated. He's requested a copy of the file upon which the designation was based, and he was declined. He's also asked about his right of appeal, and he says there is no right of appeal. 
he's raised questions about his children being designated and no answer was received. So in any rule of law, the ability to face your accuser is paramount. How can we proceed with a designations protocol when these fundamental rights of the accused are violated? I, I think that might be more of a visa restriction issue because there is a process for the financial designation side to request the underlying information to the extent that it is something that is shareable because we are an all, sor all source information office so some information we have is, is sensitive and can't be released to the public. Um, we do release that uh, either through an administrative request, there's also FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act request process. Uh, so it is an administrative procedure and we do take very serious our obligations to that because as we have all stated here, the end goal is behavior change and being able to remove someone from the SDN list is a major part of sanctions because we want to show those good news stories where yes, a official was corrupt but once they have been caught or, and they face the consequences, if they are able to sort of come to the light of you know, embracing uh, uh, law and order and, and the rule of law, then we want to highlight that and remove sanctions as sort of the, the uh, badge of shame that's on their name. Thank you very much for that question. I, and I think from the, the visa restriction side, I mean, certainly anyone is um, more than able to provide information to the department if, if they would like us to consider some additional information as we look at particular cases. But visa rec records are confidential, and it is a little bit of a different process than sanctions. Uh, it's not a behavior change tool, and um, you know there is no time limit, for example, on these designations. But certainly, anyone is, is able to provide additional information for our consideration for a particular designation. Thank you. Perhaps we can talk offline and we can um, share that information with you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to make you run around, Dylan. Let's go to the back. There you go. This gentleman. Yep. Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Mpararo. I'm coming from DRC. I'm working with an uh, anti-corruption organization, member of Transparency International. I have two questions. <coughs> the first question is for uh, OFAC represented. Uh, it's uh, regarding what, what criteria are you using to make sanction? Because we feel that when there is a sanction against a company, the company pay fine and it finished. But when there is a sanction against, against uh, an individual, the sanction is very, very huge. So which criteria are you using? The second question is uh, for INL regarding the democratic value. As you know, in our countries, I'm coming from Central Africa countries, in all the region, we have a president who has been there for 30 years. And when it's uh, coming from election, if you took Cameroon, if you took Congo Brazzaville, Uganda, Rwanda, those presidents who has been there for almost 30 years. So which restriction are you taking against them? Thank you very much. So I'll take the first one, which I, I think relates to delisting. Um, and I wouldn't say there are different criteria for delisting between uh, individuals and entities like corporations. However, I will say that for an individual to be removed from the SDN list, they have to show or prove some sort of behavior change, um, which, yes, that is, a, that is a high bar to clear. We have a high legal threshold to add someone to the SDN list, it's an equally high threshold to be removed from the SDN list. With corporations, it's a little different because the corporation itself is not engaged in corruption. It is being used as a vehicle for corruption. So if the interests of a designated individual or corrupt actor can be extinguished, um, either because the individual releases their interests in the firm, they sell off the assets, then that firm can be removed from the SDN list. And I think that might be why you see 
a number of corporations removed and potentially less individuals, as well as the fact that individuals tend to own multiple corporations. And when you get an individual removed from the list, all of his companies, you know, all of those shell companies that he may have been moving would, would also be removed from the list. Second question? So if I understood it correctly, that was a question, you know, what, what action are we taking against, against sort of um, uh, individuals that may be in power for, for, for many years and, uh, uh, you know, in, in contravention of sort of democratic principles? I mean, is that, is that correct? Is that, did I understand that? Could, could you repeat the yeah. question again? Sorry. Go, go ahead and clarify it if we just... Yes. When the, those individuals are, are violating the democratic values, in changing constitution, in uh, changing the process, electoral process, in violating human rights. We have all of those people in power in Central Africa, like in Cameroon, in Congo Brazzaville, in Uganda, in Rwanda, and uh, other countries. So which, can, which kind of restriction are you taking against those presidents? And next week, in uh, US Africa Leader Summit, they will be here in Washington. So they will meet uh, President Biden unless, despite they are violating human rights, they are corrupted, but they didn't be sanctioned or there is no restriction on visa to enter the US. Yeah, okay. So, you, you, know, one of the, you know, one of the reasons that we, we've adopted a regime like this is to, is to, is to sort of, you know, is to, is to tackle the most sort of you know, harmful and serious forms of corruption um, uh, with respect to, um, you know, and, and the impacts that has in, in, in its countries, but, but that align with our foreign policy objectives. And, and obviously sort of um, promoting democracy overseas is, 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 is kind of central to that. And so, you know, the democratic framing is, is hugely relevant to how we make decisions. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of difficult to sort of uh, talk about uh, you know, uh, why have we not sort of designated certain heads of state that, that obviously, um, y you know, uh, that don't necessarily, uh, you know, adhere to democratic principles. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've issued a sort of, we have a sort of a policy note that sits alongside the regulations that, that, that helps guide the decisions we make. And, and obviously there are a range of factors that we take into consideration when making a designation. I mean, you know, they look at the sort of, you know, scale, nature, and impact of corruption, um, uh, and they, uh, and and also, you know, the alignment with our foreign policy goals and the extent to which that designation will most is is likely to have an impact on on, on ending corruption. Um, so, so you know, we, but ultimately, we have to weigh up a whole load of factors in making a designation, and, um, you know, it, it, you know that that is a complicated process to go through. Um, and so that's why you may see that there may be some, some cases that may be obvious ones from, from an external perspective, but that don't make it through. It's because it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's tricky to balance these many, these many factors, as well as, the as well as meet the evidential threshold, um, where you need to have open source information that can, that can pretty much, beyond reasonable doubt, prove that those individuals have, have been involved in corruption. So it, it's not a direct answer to your question, but it, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of the sort of various things that we have to weigh up when making a, a decision. And, and I'll just add briefly from the U.S. perspective, of course, you know, the president has made very clear that democratic renewal and support for democracies is a key part of the president's foreign policy and our international uh, uh, affairs. Of course, we've got a variety of other tools to address issues of democratic backsliding and concerns with that. If on the farthest end of the spectrum where we have, you know, serious, you know, human rights violations, of course, there's the other prong of GLOMAG. This is a panel that's mostly focused on the, the anti-corruption piece of this, but that is one element. And then, of course, there's a variety of other programs and activities we engage in, not least of which is direct diplomatic action uh, and, and engagement with, with uh, countries where we've got concerns about uh, the democratic process and happy to have those discussions further uh, offline. Um, we're approaching the end, so we're going to go into lightning round. I got three questions I'm going to be able to do, and then unfortunately we're going to have to uh, bring it to an end. So I've got uh, a lady, I think, to the right with a red scarf. This lighting is bothering my eyes. So uh, ask your question, and then we're going to go and do two more. This gentleman up here, uh, Dylan, and then we're going to go up to this gentleman up here, and that'll be it, I'm afraid. Uh, I have two, two questions about uh, two particular cases that are happening in the Balkans, because I'm coming from there. 
So there's a, there's a case of uh, Slobodan Tashic, who is an arms and ammunition dealer from the Balkans, who's, who has been on the list uh, of US, U.S. sanctions for five years. But he managed to find a way to export arms. Sorry, like this? No, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to have to ask you to ask your question very quickly and directly so we can get to yeah, the other so two. So he find, found a way to uh, operate his businesses to proxies and export arms to the U.S. So what are the mechanisms when somebody is like having more, a com like having more, a complex operation of their business, which is not linear? like where there is like a company which is on the list and, and a person. So like in some complex situations. And the other question is regarding other Slobodan from um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, one of the richest men in that country who has been put on the sanction list this November, but he has like his businesses are selected through the loans of uh, international institutions for building roads and infrastructure. So how can that, um, what are the implications for those kind of arrangements that he already has? Thank you. All right, thank you. And Dylan up here, this gentleman. Thank you. My name is Anderson Meme. I'm from Liberia, and I work for the chapter of Transparency International Liberia. I'd like to say uh, thank you to the panel for the deliberation, and also thank you to the U.S. government um, for all of the great work it continues to do in Liberia. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about um, the sanction and um, what happens in terms of engagement with the uh, government if uh, certain government officials are sanctioned. So in Liberia, um, we've had a number of government offic officials being sanctioned. The latest, um, I three officials, one very close to the presidency. In fact, the person who manages the office of the presidency. So if you ask me, uh, I will say what that sanction means is the president himself is corrupt because the president who manages your office, um, yeah, so the okay. question, I know yeah. there's time. So the, the question there is, um, if you have an offici or official sanctioned, um, what does the U.S. government expect of that government? Is it to prosecute those people? What can they do then um, in terms of supporting that government to, to, to effect that prosecution? Then the other question is around the scope of the sanction. Do you think that um, at the moment the Global Magnitsky Law or the Act, the scope in terms of those covered by the sanction, is it uh, adequate enough or if there's a need for expansion to cover other aspects that you might not be considering at the moment? Thank you. Thank you very much. And to, the, to this gentleman up here, um, and, and sir, please, a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I am Raul, a journalist from Haiti. Uh, my question is, um, about the sanctions. Uh, what happened is my country is part right now of the countries that are targeted by the sanctions. And uh, we have many high profile politicians that are targeted. Uh, what the people sometimes do not understand is the fact that the USA sanctioned someone for drug trafficking, human rights violations, and times of acute crisis uh, like what we have here in Haiti but they do not understand why a few months earlier uh, these same personalities had the chance to sit with U.S. envoys to discuss about um, dialogue um, and solutions to, 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 to get the country out of crisis. So the people do not understand how you can sanction someone you have been talking to a few months earlier while you say you've been investigating on, on these personalities for months and sometimes years. Okay. So how do we explain that to, to people who um, do not really want to go through nuances and everything? They, they just want to understand. All right. Thank you. Over to you guys. Feel free to tackle any one of those. Yeah, please. Just one broad point, because um, I got a lot of questions from civil society and investigative journalists. I think one thing that we always try to stress in our project is that 
it's impossible for government to do everything about every single case around the world because the vast, vast amounts of information that's out there that's going uh, unutilized um, means that it's important for civil society organizations to play that filtering role. It's why, this is, it sounds like a pitch, it's not, honestly, but if anyone does have information about any of their cases related to an individual in their country, bring it to us because what we will then do is filter through what you have and then act as that first stage before giving information to these guys to make sure that what is going to them is efficient and effective and that means that a designation can be made um, quickly. Um, well, I say quickly, that's not up to me. But if I think that's a really important point for each of the questioners, make sure that we're all working together outside of government to make sure that what we're submitting to them is as effective as possible. I would say similarly, I mean, I mean, for our visa designations, as I mentioned earlier, the, the evidentiary bar is quite high. And, you know, in those places where there's a robust civil society, there's investigative journalism, there tends to be more information that we can use for our designations. Um, and in those places where, uh, you know, that is lacking, um, it's more difficult to um, meet the evidentiary bar that is required for our, our visa restrictions. So a similar appeal is the one that Kush just, just mentioned. Um, and certainly I, I think we are looking to continue to grow and use our uh, visa restrictions strategically to target, um, you, you know, the, the, those places and individuals where we see uh, corrupt actors. Great. Um, just a few comments. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of sort of engagement with governments following following a designation, I mean, I think you know, when we make designations, we'll be you know we'll be communicating that you know at a country level if 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 a, if, a, if, a, if someone from a government is is, is designated and, and and you know explaining quite clearly why that why that has why that action has taken place and and try to use that opportunity as a way to to promote or encourage wider reform. I mean, that's ultimately the ambition. Um, and I think that goes back to the point around how we need to use our various tools or whatever. So this is, so these, so you can, so sanctions can be that sort of instigator of something bigger, um, but, but obviously it doesn't always happen and it's not always possible or, or that, you know, it's on a case by case basis, you know, the story will differ, um, but, that, but that is ultimately what we're trying to do. I mean, the scope of the designations, I mean, I spoke about some of that at the beginning. I mean, we, you know, that, you know, we, there is possibilities for us to look at the scope of our designations and we will kind of continue to, to monitor that but I think at the moment we're focused on, on on trying to use our tools as you know within within their current scope which we feel is is, is, is pretty broad and and, and and can be really impactful um, because just rev reviewing and you know the scope of a, of a regulation will just take a huge amount of time and that's that, that's time that could be used you know towards towards using the tool so I think that's probably where we are on that um, uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, and knowing that I can't speak to any specific investigation, um, I would say when it comes to really complicated schemes where individuals have very diverse networks, uh, sanctions are, we, we rely heavily on the private sector, particularly financial institutions, to comply with sanctions and help us enforce them. So when you're looking at the SDN list, that's what publicly goes out to all financial institutions in the private sector, letting them know that these individuals, that they are on the list and you cannot interact with them unless you yourself want to potentially be either the subject of fines or a target of future investigations. Um, when you have these massive networks that maybe are not caught on the SDN list, this is where civil society can play a really critical role. When you publish what these uh, networks look like, financial institutions will often take that into account in their compliance networks, and they will start adding those lists as something they should take uh, a closer look at and potentially you know, block transactions or maybe de-risk from some of those firms. And it's always a sign of a great panel where we've got, uh, unfortunately, the, the flip side, but more, many more questions we were able to answer during our, our time that was allotted here. So uh, very much appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us here. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for their time as well today. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.